Gene doesn't miss his train. Um, I'm going to be uh, just as brief as introductions will allow. Mr. Wright needs no introduction. Dinah, if we were going to say anything other than the, uh, the obvious in the profile, it would be that once upon a time I tried to teach a seminar called Historical Introduction to Common Law Literature, Bracton to Holmes, and Dinah was one of the victims. And it seems not to have prevented her from living a distinguished and useful career in the world, taking care of more important stuff than Cook on Littleton. Um, Gene, it, it, it would be fair to say, is um, uh, an institution in Washington from the time when that was not a curse to utter. Uh, <laughs> And over the years, there were many times, I admit that Democrats were mostly in office during those times, but not only, uh, when I had a problem of one kind or another and everybody said to me, oh, you should talk to Gene, because indeed, when government works, it solves a lot of problems, and Gene is a problem solver. Thus, we are now discussing a problem. Um, I don't wish to be, uh, you know, unduly negative about it. Um, there are good things about this. I was sitting in my attic in Amsterdam writing uh, my book one day and Facebook stock dropped $100 billion. And I, I, I thought, that's a pretty good day. Why don't I go and get a beer? Uh, it, it, I was. Uh, that, that's, that's true. Um, it, it, is, it is the case that, that even if you believe in presently existing social networking more than I do, uh, the, the reality of oncoming uh, regulation is not a thing you can ignore. Uh, it isn't the case that we're going to come out of all the experience we've currently had uh, without regulation of the platform companies. It's as unthinkable as if we actually weren't going to regulate the environment. In the end, of course, there will be legislation of various kinds in various places in the world. But right now, we are casting about for strategies to deal with overwhelming private power unconstrained by the rules that have previously existed because the economy and politics have changed. The, the premise of this panel, therefore, subject to our in-house skepticism, which Mr. Wright has generously offered to provide, is that regulation of the social media platform companies is inevitable. It will occur, most likely in a disorderly and complex manner, raising global problems and distorting the world trade system in unforeseeable ways. But as I brought Professor Carroll here to say this morning, and as I find in my conversations with government officials around the world, there are greater fears even than that now afoot as people begin to recognize that democracy itself needs shoring up against the basis of private economic power. It's been a hundred years and more since we were last in that position in the United States. That was the form in which American public law thinking dwelt from 1894 to 1916. It made the Sherman Act. It made Clayton. It made the Federal Trade Commission. Long may it live and someday may it wave. Um, we, we created the institutions of competition law because we were afraid of the effect of private power on democracy. And whether it was Theodore Roosevelt or it was uh, Louis Dembitz Brandeis and Woodrow Wilson, this was the great issue of the time in the politics of the American Republic at the opening of the 20th century. What happened after that to antitrust, as I suggested in the materials I put forward for you to read, was characterized by the great historian Richard Hofstadter as the disappearance of the antitrust movement. Whatever happened to antitrust, it became a technical subject in the middle of the 20th century. And it gained weight and power and importance in American government precisely to the extent that it lost its political edge and ceased to be about the protection of democracy and became instead about the protection of consumer welfare. We are as far from Hofstadter's argument now as Hofstadter was himself from the Sherman Act. He is essentially the midpoint of this conversation now. And the cycle has renewed itself. And once again, we are asking not merely about consumer welfare or the pricing of social media services, but about the consequences for democracy. 
What I wanted from this panel, those for, those skeptical, those against, whatever it is, is to ask two questions. If regulation is going to occur, how might our experience with FOSS inform our judgments about the tools and systems that we might use? And second, what is the heart of our effort in the dealing with the platform companies? What is the new theory upon which we are engaging with these private powers? What is it that we intend to subdue? Professor Carroll's argument in essence is we intend to subdue corruption. Professor Carroll's argument is that there is a loss of integrity in the system arising from the behavior of people empowered with too much data. And I thought it was a powerful case, but I don't think it's the only case possible. I don't think it captures necessarily what we are most afraid of, which may not be corruption or the exceptional. It may be the routine and the ordinary that raises our greatest threat. Dino, from the point of view of the human rights community, from the point of view of those people who think that this results in, in, in the most serious of harms to human integrity and human safety, what is this social media regulation moment about? Well, this one? Done. Okay. Um, you know, the way I think about these things is, you know, what tool is interesting to you depends on what you want to use it for and what you fear, as you point out, Evan. And so uh, 37 years of thinking of human rights makes me think in terms of human rights uh, problems. And uh, the problems of social media are pretty well known. I think it's useful to, in this little slide, I was just sort of pointing out that speech on social media is a little different than speech in the Washington, you know, post. Um, it's global, even though its effects may be very different from locality to locality. People want to be on it for the network effect, not because it's, it's the biggest thing in their neighborhood, necessarily. Um, social media rewards emotion and extremes, not deliberation, with more clicks. Uh, it's instantaneous, it's viral, it can be an incitement accelerator, and it's weirdly persistent. So all these kinds of um, special features make the human rights impacts more exciting. You can go to the next slide. Um, thank you. What do I do? Do I do it? Well, that got rid of everything. <laughs> there, you go. there we go. And so you get these, you know, human rights problems. That's how I think about what we're trying to address, at least when I think in human rights watch terms. So first you have a whole mess of censorship problems. How do you um, get rid of the stuff that there's a fair amount of universal agreement is bad stuff, child porn, beheading videos, revenge porn. Uh, defamation. Then there's all this undesirable stuff that may lead to violations of law. Um, electoral dif d disinformation, self-harm clubs, that's just a viol- you know, you may get uh, kids hurting themselves or people not being able to inhibit public health problems, hateful speech that eventually poisons the well to act as hate incitement. Uh, and then there's, of course, just the whole universe of stuff you don't like, disfavored speech, whatever those in power would like to not see. Um, and here, you know, the problems are well known. It's really hard, even when there's a fair amount of consensus on the standard, to identify the bad stuff uh, and identify it quickly. Who's making the decisions? Are we lobbying it to companies? Is, is it all about Facebook's community standards or are we actually protecting speech? And what rights does the speaker have? And whatever those questions are, they're even more problematic when you're thinking about over-censorship, which is the other side of it, the access to information side. But of course, the woes don't really start there, stop there. Then you have, um, 
all the other human rights problems, privacy and autonomy, and this is what I think you're talking about, em, Eben. You know, it's not just privacy, it's not just the discrimination that gets baked into algorithms because they are trained on the discriminatory data of our discriminatory world, but it's essentially the, the erosion of human autonomy and society. Um, when your information is fed to you by an algorithm that is influenced by all these factors I talked about, um, do you really retain freedom of belief, freedom of opinion? Do you have a real choice in elections? And I think that's what Carol Cadwallader was trying to make as a point that you know, our very system of electoral democracy is endangered. Um, do you really have freedom of association when the only people you're likely to meet are people who think just like you? Um, and those are very profound challenges to the whole premise of human rights in a liberal democratic society. <laughs> okay, this is what you need to know about me is I can barely operate any technology. Um, and so the common fixes here are, you know, not very satisfying in terms of addressing the whole panoply of rights uh, harms. And uh, I'm, I'm going to get done with this in two seconds. So, you know, the first fix that people like to talk about is competition law or antitrust law. Um, we're not even sure it would apply in the United States, much less apply in a meaningful way. Um, it's not clear it will actually address the, all the economic incentives that drive poor moderation policies and opaque and unchallengeable censorship rules or even profiling or unlawful data collection. So then you get to things like, okay, the US needs a data protection law and ideas like data ownership. And here, you know, the remedies are fairly untested. Um, megaliths like Facebook aren't really deterred by fines, only small competitors are. In fact, you start to wonder whether the European regulators just really want to milk Facebook rather than destroy it. Um, and then uh, there's also, I think, a fundamental problem, which is uh, these, these regimes are based on the idea of individual control and consent. And the problem is everybody consents. Consent is just not a great control. And if you have a model of regulation that depends on the individual, um, you're missing the siren call of network effect. And I think that's where some of the FOSS you know, solutions are um, maybe worth thinking about because I don't know if everybody's going to want to um, flock to Mastodon rather than Facebook or something like that. So I think we have to think about that. Did I? You, yeah, you better do it. <laughs> and then finally, um, you know, there's a whole other set of kind of more realistic fixes, right? There's basically more of what we already have, more subject matter or area regulation. Let's, let's make special rules for electoral speech or special rules for revenge porn. Um, and it'll still have all the problems that I mentioned before. Then there is the whole issue of how do we understand what that algorithm is doing? Okay, we need transparency and explainability requirements, not just for consumer trust, but for real legal control. In other words, I want to be able to litigate this. Um, and I think we're very far from that, uh, being able to realize that politically. Do we make different regimes for your data and your data ownership uh, that, that bar the government from getting your data from a private company? That's going to be real tough, uh, knowing what we know already about government practices. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of values-based ideas, um, you know, designing for privacy, designing for health, designing for ethics. Um, and then there are ideas about well, maybe we should treat social media like it's a regulated utility or a commons. So have I kind of, you know, now given you the, I'll hand it over to you to actually tell people what the real content is. Okay, she did it. Okay. What's your problem? What's your solution? Okay, Evan, I don't know why you needed me here because you said everything at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's why I, we didn't need me. Yeah, that's no. the real but thank you, thank you for inviting me. Um, and I apologize that I will have to run um, at four. Um, but um, these are overwhelming problems that you're describing. I wanna go back and, and um, 
differentiate one piece of what you said at the beginning, Eben, about the earlier antitrust and its relationship to democracy. I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I think the, the, um, the leading voice for that was Louis Brandeis um, in promoting the creation of the Federal Trade Commission, in promoting an aggressive use of antitrust for broad purposes. However, Louis Brandeis was also the father of most of our most effective regulatory agencies, many of which you named. So from the very beginning, it was never believed that antitrust could do all of these things itself. And, um, and I think it has a little more limited role, especially when, when you talk about uh, disinformation and the broad questions of censorship. Um, it's a limited tool. So I want to try to, I want to see if I can put this into a productive context of how we might want to think about regulation. And I just start with what are the dynamics of the market? We can talk about a million problems, but what, what's going on here that's got everyone's attention? I was fortunate enough to work on the uh, Stigler report that was published this summer, Stigler Center report on, um, on market structure and work with some excellent economists, so I owe them all of uh, the information that I'm gonna present here. We looked at what was really going on here, and where you start in antitrust is, is there a market problem? Answer was clearly yes. There's dominance in a number of key areas, clearly in search, clearly in social networks themselves. Many people believe it's coming in the digital advertising network structure. Many people believe it's coming in online shopping um, in, as, a, as a commercial um, platform. Um, many believe it's coming in some of the strong apps that are being delivered vertically through the digital platforms. Um, and with that knowledge, you look at the marketplace and say, We've been here before. This has happened in many industries. It's happened in technology many, many times. Markets usually self-correct. Are they self-correcting? So the next bit of analysis was looking at entry. Are companies openly, quickly, innovatively entering in search, in social networking, in some of these other areas? Not very much. In some countries with very protective legal frameworks, yes, and becoming dominant there with geographic protections, but not in the US and in Europe, um, in these particular areas. Um, is money flowing to new ventures not, that are being portrayed, held out as independent new players in it for the long run? Absolutely not. It is flowing, but to developers who readily say they're happy to be purchased by Facebook and Google, possibly Amazon. Um, so why? Well, when you look at the underlying forces, they've all been mentioned here. I'm just going to frame it up. Um, network effects, not new. We've had it with many brick and mortar industries. Economies of scale, big upfront capital investments to build a network, and then declining marginal costs going forward. Think railroads, think telecommunications. Again, we've had it many, many times before. Um, what is different is data. Now, data aren't new, right? But what's different is the way in which data can be monetized on a digital platform creates additional powers of scope. Often when you add services in a conglomerate form, you can provide new things, but you don't get any particular efficiencies from it. But what we're seeing with some of the digital platforms is that by knowing more about Eben doesn't necessarily enhance the original service that was being offered. It enhances the broader view of his tastes, his predilections, his preferences, his emotions at certain times that build better artificial intelligence, better data sets, better ability to monetize products and services that can be sold. When you add all these together, that's quite powerful. And one further element that, that was just referred to is what was usually called consumer choice and the convenience of the platforms 
is now being perceived more and more in, in behavioral psychology as consumer manipulation. Why? Because it is convenient, it is easy, it is, one-stop shopping has always been um, a great um, positive attribute of markets when you can offer people more services in a, in a more efficient way. But are we nudging people to do, buy, say, think things that they didn't naturally, they weren't naturally inclined to do or taking advantage of their emotions at a moment's time a death, a need to travel, a change in business plans, a loss of a job, to monetize that and take advantage of it. So these forces together are really quite powerful. And with limited entry, you then turn and say, what can antitrust do? Well, antitrust can do lots of things. It is a sledgehammer. At the same time, it is a very narrow tool. You can break companies up. But you have to have misbehavior. Antitrust does not condemn, and this is true in Europe as well, everywhere in the world, does not con condemn the, the fact of monopoly. It condemns efforts to monopolize and efforts to preserve monopoly and cartels and other anti-competitive behavior. It is about bad behavior, not about being powerful. If you gained it on the merits in the marketplace, you're not violating the antitrust laws. And many of the things that we're seeing here could involve some bad behavior, and that's why we have investigations going on. Hopefully that's why we have investigations going on and not other reasons. Um, but um, <laughs> one never knows. Um, but certainly they're, going, they're ongoing. But again, to use a tool that has a limited reach to get at the underlying economics except the misbehavior. But even if you have misbehavior in those markets, think about those forces. Um, some people want to break up. Um, others want to use other tools. Um, the antitrust enforcement apparatus cannot change the underlying economic forces. If Facebook were two companies and it had the same economic incentives against it, three or four, same economic incentives, same network effects, it is probably likely one will win. It is likely that many of them will misbehave in competition with each other to become that winner. So that's the problem with antitrust. So where do we go from there? Do we throw up our hands? I don't think so. What we have done and what Louis Brandeis and others recommended decades ago always is think of a broader set of policy tools that might be useful. Now regulation can misfire in many, many ways. Um, but I would want to start with looking at trying to develop a rigorous structure for how to think about it. What is the problem? What are we trying to solve for? What is an effective remedy? The kinds of things I think that would work for what we talked about so far as being underlying market problems don't relate to just saying, poof, we can create a direct competitor. You have to go back to the nature of the market. Where does competition look like it might come from? It's usually not a direct competitor. It's more like someone in a vertical space who becomes popular, develops a platform, develops a lot of um, underlying consumer support, builds a new kind of network that can compete for the market as opposed to within the market and possibly challenge the growth potential for the existing players. It's where the market is heading next that you need to worry about. Can you stop it from being dominant across the board? And so things like interoperability, interconnection across networks. Um, I would suggest we need portability with data protections. You cannot do it without privacy, and you shouldn't do privacy without some meaningful portability to go with it. Otherwise, privacy can just enshrine dominant players inadvertently. Um, standards, another way of trying to build transparency, trying to build um, broad industry consensus from players who are not the dominant players to develop the norms in the market. Non-discrimination rules, not favoring yourself. We've done this in many industries at many times. Um, and um, in the intellectual property area. And finally, I think we have to come up with separate standards for mergers. 
among dominant platforms. So these are the things I think should be the focus of regulation um, within the competition space. Would they help with democracy? I hope so. Would they help with some of the disinformation problems? I'm not sure. Those might require different tools. Um, and I wouldn't want to pretend that they would automatically do that. But those are the places I think we need to go. So where does FOSS fit in this? I'm no expert on it, but it strikes me that for every one of these tools I've described, um, free and open software could be a critical element, could be a norm for developing the kinds of rules that could apply effectively. Um, I don't know that open software would be very helpful without interoperability in certain networks. So I think it plays a key role within the process of both developing and thinking about the implementation of any kind of effective regulations we might develop. What do you think is the time frame? Imagine that we had a Justice Department interested in justice. Imagine that we had a European Commission actually capable of being sure. Europe. Imagine all the things that we would like in order to be effective. Well, and we knew what we were doing. How long right. do you think it would take so to before, get some of what we need? Before we get to know what we're doing, I'll just add to the, to the, the list of horrors here. Um, I mean, antitrust lit litigation often takes uh, years. A year to two to investigate, a year plus to litigate. If you litigate all the way through, appeals, another couple years. I mean, these markets are way too dynamic for that. That's not going to solve a problem in, in the near term. It might freeze certain behavior for a while, but that's about it. So that's a fundamental problem there. The other fundamental problem is we've got a Congress that hasn't passed laws in ages. In this area, hasn't passed laws in even longer and doesn't have the muscle power to think through how to do that. That might sound superficial, but it's really important. The skill to pass laws requires some ability to do bipartisan negotiation and, and do it well. You need to be able to get at the core uh, technical and marketplace developments that are going on. So it's going to take a, quite a while. But I think that um, uh, no one would have thought that you would could, you, I mean, at, at the time it was proposed, no one would, would have thought that you could have a Financial Consumer Protection Bureau. We had many banking agencies. We had many even on my, of my friends against it because we had so many agencies. Why do we need another one? But it was a financial crisis that m created the opening in Dodd-Frank for that agency to be created. So sometimes it's just a market failure. Sometimes it's something going awry. So I just think we have to be prepared. Be the oracle. <laughs> that, that's one thing I will not be today. I think, you know, the, the question that, that this prompts, I, honestly, I'm, I am less skeptical than I'd expected of, of either of my co-panelists here. But, um, <laughs> that's what law school is for. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, on the last point strikes me as potentially most salient here, which is that in the landscape of non-trivially different problems um, uh, regarding which we could conjecture a variety of behavioral or structural remedies, right? But the absence of the will to legislate them, you are left with a hammer. Hammers just break stuff and I, I guess I would ask, you know, what we think the odds are of antitrust successfully being litigated to a remedy for, for example, the disinformation problem. This seems to me, uh, a low likelihood outcome, as opposed to, you know, turning back to the subject of the talk, right? What have we learned from the FOSS experience, right? Well, you know, color, color me uh, looking more recently uh, than Brandeis at the antitrust litigations around Microsoft, right? The Netscape case, you know, you know, 
Evan, what, you know, what did you think about the uh, the compulsion of Microsoft to make its uh, make its communication protocols accessible? You think that was a real successful outcome? I I don't. Yes, I don't. It was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I guess my here's here's the sort of larger <laughs> here's the larger question. Yeah. Um, In pragmatic terms, before there was Facebook, there was MySpace. Anybody in the audience still use MySpace? Okay. <laughs> so, so the idea, you know, the idea in, in that I've been ruminating on is the extent to which technology is able to solve this problem far more easily than either litigation or legislation. And that for that to happen is not an impossibility, right? People, you know, people picked up Linux. We're not all running Windows Server, right? How did that happen? It happened because the technologists created something and the people valued their freedom, right? So it seems to me that, a, that while approaching things, you know, a, a, approaching the idea of regulation and approaching the idea of solving problems through antitrust, right? Those, those are certainly worthy of exploring, you know, with, with with a keen eye toward their limitations. But a better avenue of exploration, or at least, at least maybe not better, but parallel, a parallel avenue of exploration seems to me to be facilitating the consumers who, as you, you rightfully point out, right, getting their consent is not achieving anything because they want to benefit from these network effects. So then the question is, how do we technologically make it possible for them to do so while providing the protection that you would otherwise seek? May I, may I interject one thing between the, the points? I think those are all very strong points. Um, one thing I failed to point out is the most powerful force related to legislation is not becoming law, it's the process of legislating. And in my more than 35 years of, of doing this kind of work, I have found markets adjust as policymakers start taking things seriously. And, and true for antitrust litigation as well. If you think the hammer is coming and it's gonna break something, you start changing your behavior and negotiating. So these are all sticks that are there, not necessarily to get over a particular finish line, but to prompt markets to adjust. So that, it seems to me, is the problem of the time scale. What antitrust could be doing now is prompting bargaining in the shadow of the law much faster than it could be prompting actual remedies delivered, as Jim points out. I do think you're right, Sam, that there was some value realized from antitrust litigation against Microsoft. Can I give a specific example? Yeah, just because I want Gene to be able to get his train, I will suggest that we do this in a slightly different sequence. I do think that the important point, however, was that it took a very long time and it cost a great deal of money. And if Microsoft's uh, uh, monopolization of APIs had posed an immediate danger to democracy, it would have taken us too long. What, what, what the free software movement did was to change the game on Microsoft, not by finding a way to destroy them, but by finding a way to make a ton of money for them that didn't involve monopolizing APIs anymore and did involve all of the forms of constructive engagement that Nicola and Keith were talking about. I think we have a badly formed market in the following respect. We have a market in services which gives people an apparent zero price in return for collection of behavior. This, I think, is the root of the problem. We want to restructure the market for services so that people are not priced in a fashion which they do not understand and which is harmful to them. And obscure pricing of a deceptive kind is a thing for which regulation can function. <laughs> 
The second thing I think we have is a telecommunications system which no longer actually serves primarily for telecommunications and serves primarily for behavior collection. And therefore what we need is regulation of behavior collection. Our mutual friend Danny Weitzner, when he worked in the White House, used to say to me all the time, the FCC is the single most captured agency of American government. And there is at least an argument that he was right. Capture of the FCC means that the FCC continues to regulate telecommunications instead of behavior collection because that's what AT&T and Verizon and Sprint, T-Mobile, whatever we're to call them, actually want. That is telecommunications regulators wrapped up in the old game they all know how to play instead of busy regulating behavior collection, which is the true job of the FCC in my opinion about the world in which we live. This, it is possible for Congress to have an effect upon. Uh, the FCC is responsive to Congress, almost as responsive as AT&T and Verizon, and as you point out, they're not on the other end of the phone. But that's a legitimate, possible effort in American government. And I think it is even more a possible effort in European government because I think the incoming commission really is prepared to ask about behavior collection as a new avenue of regulation. So I think that's a, a definitely a worthy, worthy path. I think there still is a pure legal restriction on who the FCC can regulate that will stymie quite a bit of that. So we do need Congress to do it. But your second point is, I think, the most salient. Europe will do this. Um, and I think the fact that Magreta Vestager is now moving from being not just com competition commissioner, where she did apply the antitrust laws very aggressively, and I think she will find many of the results are less than satisfying in Europe, to being a broader authority over the digital marketplace recommending additional tools being applied. I don't know that they will be the right tools. I don't know that they'll be effective, but they will be much broader than antitrust. And I think that will be a model the companies have to deal with. And the, then the politics may change if a significant portion of the market is driving their own business model towards a different set of norms and values. Which we can do by affecting what we invent. This is why Freedom Box is still important to me. We can federate services more effectively. We can give people technology that federates services. There are a lot of people for whom WhatsApp is really important for talking to their families. I can do that over a Freedom Box without involving a centralizing behavior collecting intermediary and they will experience the same benefits of interpersonal communication they experience now. A government which encouraged federation of services and which had Gene's goals with respect to the nature of the politics would be a government that could affect the situation on the time scales we require. What do you think? I think I would just add that to the extent that you structurally separate the collection of the data from its use, that it, that is not sufficient to to achieve the goal. You would you would have to effectively eliminate the ability to target. And I believe that this will be legislatively unpalatable. I also believe that the consumers who consent to it will continue, e even if that separation is made, to elect not, to, to elect to permit the continued targeting. Um, and that being the case, you know, again, I fall back on if you want to preserve people's ability to understand how that data is being consumed to generate content for them, you have to make it possible for them to understand the data itself and, and make those choices intelligently. And the, the volume and type of data we're talking about is sufficiently complex that I think presenting that to them in a, in a cogent way that's actionable is, 
per perhaps the defining technical challenge of this issue? I think that one of the elements you're missing here is that governments have no incentive essentially to limit the data collection. And that's a real problem here. So what you're describing with Freedom Box, you know, has to be consumer driven. And in my experience, those kinds of consumer drives towards better values, towards protecting your rights, happen in relation to catastrophic events and movements on the street. So who feels most passionately about facial recognition right now? Kids in Hong Kong. They feel really passionate, right? And if they had a democratically responsive government, they'd get good regulations from it, but they don't. Um, similarly, um, if you can figure out why people will suddenly want FOSS products, there'll be a, a pressure on the companies, right? And on the regulators and on the elections, on, on the whole ecosystem. But we haven't even been able to stem the most horrible overreaches of our own government during Obama's time, so I'm not particularly optimistic about this. This is a social movement that you need, not only a technology movement. I thought I was the skeptic here. No, I think we're all actually in precisely the same place. We think, unless the free software movement can become a cultural and political movement in addition to a technical movement, democracy is in real trouble and there may not be time for even effectively functioning governments, let alone the ones we actually have, to intervene in a constructive way before everything falls off the table. That, I think, is what we share. Jim says that's really hard for a set of reasons. You say that's really hard for a slightly different set of reasons. Gene says it's really hard for yet another set of reasons, and I agree with all of you. And yet, if all the inventing that we did, if all the stuff we made and all the ways we learned about how to change the culture of making is to have the effect we set out for it, then this is the problem that we have to solve and now is the time when we have to solve it. I think technology and culture reinforce one another in cyclic ways. I think if you invent the vast wasteland of presently existing commercial television as it was when I was young, you get an awful lot of frozen dinners eaten in front of presently existing commercial television. We changed all that in different ways that became really important even though the details of how we affected how how people watch video and what video they watch and at what time of day they watch it was not designed for the improvement of home cuisine or the, or the subjugation of the vast wasteland. Culture changed as technology changed and they did it in ways that were non-linear and mutually reinforcing. I think the problem is you have to know how to get the ball rolling. We did know something about that with respect to the making of software and information technology. We did figure out how to get the ball rolling. It was, as I said in Berlin in 2003, proof of concept plus running code equals revolution. We changed the way people understood how technology was made by democratizing the ability to make it to the point at which people actually began to change their own circumstances and the bargaining in the shadow of those changes and the law altered the way the IT industry of the world worked. The problem was that we made tools for doing things we didn't want to have happen and they were really good tools and so they started happening, any, happening anyway. But I do believe the same cyclical structures are available to us now. You say we need a culture change. I think that's right. You say we don't need consent. In my classroom, that's the beginning part of the discussion about privacy. Privacy in my classroom is an ecological issue and we don't do environmental law based on consent. I think you're right. If people had to consent to individual chemicals in the water and individual concentrations of chemicals in the water and as soon as you check the box, yes, I consent to the current water quality I have, that was it forever, I do not think we could have environmental regulation and I do not think the water would be safe to drink anywhere. 
It is because we are willing to make standards of social performance and say that we're going to hold people to them that the cycle begins, which leads soon to much more environmental consciousness among the young, much more suspicion of the process of check here to kill everybody, much less suspicion, much more suspicion of terms of service we don't read. In other words, if we began to treat this as an ecological problem, and we invited the young people of our societies to confront it as an ecological problem, as the second most serious ecological problem their generation confronts. And if we said these things are related to one another, these two ecological crises you face in your lifetime are related to one another and they must be thought about politically and socially in similar terms, I think we would get somewhere. This is part of why I want Freedom Box to be engaged in trying to establish the carbon footprint of cloud computing. This is part of why I want young people around the world to be able to think about two sets of problems which are quite different in strongly related ways. Why we don't do consent to global warming and why therefore we shouldn't do consent for privacy destruction. In my classroom here, the tagline is, if data is the new petroleum, then privacy destruction is global warming on internet time. And if that's right, if that relationship is right, if we're confronting different kinds of technology out of control in which it is hard for people to act globally on the basis of what they learn locally, then maybe we share some solutions and maybe those solutions are related to what we did with FOSS. Again, I want to say, Sam's not wrong. There's nothing wrong with antitrust enforcement. Nobody would say there was. But antitrust is slow and expensive and partial. And you pointed it out. Hammers only break things. We need constructive solutions to this problem of privacy, not merely destructive solutions. Merely breaking things up and wait, waiting to see how they recombine is too slow, too doubtful, and too uncertainly related to the objectives we really have. I think we're all skeptical. I don't think there was anybody on this panel who wasn't a skeptic. The question is whether it is possible to be an optimist while being a skeptic. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a little bomblet into what is your hopeful vision. I'm going to say, look, you know, in terms of climate change and environment, you know, we're running behind. We can't wait there either. Um, and I would actually suggest that this be thought of, and privacy, if you talk about privacy as though it were clean water, you're not going to get far because privacy, first of all, like clean water, can be bought by the rich. And secondly, nobody thinks it's a strong right. So I would say that part of the issue here is thinking more about the crisis as a national security interest. And that's where it gets tricky, right? Because the government likes to think about national security in one way. I, as a human rights advocate, think about national security uh, in a somewhat different way. And I don't think of it as at all inimical to rights. I think that it is in our national security interest to have good rights, good protection for rights. But I think that's why so many nonprofit uh, co-opted by industry efforts right now are focusing on the issue of um, a Geneva Conventions, a cyber war, the atmosphere of attack, uh, and these issues of uh, tariffs, closed markets, export controls. This is the typical grounds of state relations and national security, and I think that's actually where the powers that be have their minds right now. Nothing mutually exclusive between those two theories. If you want to be hopeful about how, you, how far you can get negotiating with CIA and NSA, I welcome you to do it. And sometimes it works. And similarly, I don't think you really want to have to pose the proposition as though there was never any nonlinear response to ecological situations. Because if you say that, then we're not just running behind. Game over. We are drowned. So I think the question is whether a mixed set of optimisms would suit us better, and I'm glad to hear it will. You still haven't said, we can't do this. And I don't think Jim has said we can't do this, and certainly it wasn't Gene. I think we all believe that something could be done. 
I think we all believe it's a difficult problem and the clock is running against us and time isn't on our side. I think the fact that regulation is inevitable isn't any good news because we don't know what the regulation is or where it will come from or whether it will have a coherent social theory behind it. And we don't trust the governments, no matter whether we think the grass is greener on the other side of the Atlantic or not, we still don't really trust the governments to do the job. And the young people in our world, the people who are actually going to have to complete this revolution for us, they trust the governments less than we do because they've never lived under a trustworthy government in their lifetimes. And we have some sense of what is possible that is generated from a much more benign world in which we all grew up and came to our forms of public service and legal effort and all of that. We face people who really don't believe there is a good answer to these questions, but they need one desperately. Their phones are in their hands and their backs are against the wall. And if we don't have a way of offering them multiple strategies to win, then we begin to confront their desperation. And the best of the desperate are violent, and therefore we live on the edge where we live now. Even you can go along with that, Mr. Wright, or you think I'm wrong? I, I think so, although I think I, I think I stand on the point that you need to present people with a set of controls on a very sophisticated set of pipes. And before you can even get them sufficiently interested, they have to gain some understanding of how those pipes work today. I don't, th I don't believe that notwithstanding the protestations of the, the public about Cambridge Analytica and the movements that have driven Twitter to say they won't accept political ads or Facebook to maybe do that at some, maybe cave and do that in the future. I, I don't believe that that is sufficient to establish a fundamental understanding by you know even our generation let, let alone the younger generation of the threat that is actually posed let alone get them to do the work that is necessary in order to ameliorate it anybody want in before Mishi brings the roof down? well there's coffee and people should just feel free to get coffee and snacks and come back on their tables um, and also ask questions although this clock is also running out questions comments clock is running out it's true the clocks running out <laughs> thanks a lot I thought it was a very interesting uh, so it's, some of you have, I'm Thomas Schreins from NYU Law, it's, some of you have mentioned it. the question whether the EU is milking the US platform companies or whether the US is outsourcing its antitrust enforcement to Europe. And I would be interested in hearing your thoughts about um, two contrarian uh, interventions that antitrust authorities could take. So th the first one is what the German antitrust authority did this February, uh, which is to read privacy law into antitrust law and to establish the abuse of a dominant market position on the basis of privacy violations by saying that the consent requirements that Facebook uses as a pretext for data collections are actually not, do not live up to the standard or the spirit of the GDPR and that signals to the antitrust authority a violation of antitrust law. But interestingly, the remedy they imposed was not to slap some fine that is the equivalent of one hour of uh, uh, revenue generation, but to block Facebook from concentrating the data um, that Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram um, collect re respectively. So the question would be whether you think it's a good idea to not treat privacy law and antitrust law as separate domains, but as integrated ones, and whether you think that um, blocking the concentration of data is a possible avenue. That's the first one. The second one is exactly doing the, the opposite. So thinking about whether we need more data sharing which is of course an intention with privacy, but I thought because this panel on, on platform regulation was so, talking so much about privacy and personal data, there's also a question of the economic consequences of data concentration that is not personal data. 
and whether to the extent we can meaningfully differentiate between different categories of data, we actually need more data sharing. And maybe that's where FOSS can actually provide some lessons as to how we can um, bring the spirit that sharing is, is good for society um, to the data concentration that is happening right now. I think with respect to looking at antitrust and privacy as though they could operate together, that's fine, but it still doesn't address some of the basic problems. Um, and, and to my mind, the most frightening of these problems is the, um, the, the commoditization of data and, our pro and profiling. And, and you might do a bit of that. Uh, you might help or slow it down or make it you know, make more bumps in the road that way, but it doesn't really get at the issue. Um, and it doesn't also get at the issue of, you know, even an elaborated, clearer consent. I, it, people are gonna consent. They're gonna, they're gonna consent no matter what. They want, they want to have that access to that app, right? Um, so I don't, so while I think that's useful, just like I think um, it was useful <laughs> that, you know, uh, Ocasio-Cortez was trying to see if Zuckerberg lied to Congress, you know, always good to make people, you know, scared about dissembling. Um, it's not necessarily a solution to any of the problems that we raised. Um, and on uh, making data common data, of course, you know, there are many good reasons to pool data and to use uh, AI beneficially and enable research, but that's also not really the solution to the problem we outlined of um, manipulated profiling and undermining of real human autonomy and choice. I'm working on a paper about this policy question for the incoming European Commission, and I should be discreet in what I say, I suppose, if I wish my advice to have any value at all. But what I will say to you is that I think that you greatly underestimate the quandary of the European regulator. The primary quandary of the European regulator isn't a tactical problem, it's a strategic problem. There is no precedent on earth for successfully regulating an industry you don't have any of. The primary problem of the European regulator is that European people are simply commodities for Chinese and North American manipulation. There is no European industry to build, no champion to have, no party to put in the ring. And therefore, the problem of the regulator is how to beat something with nothing. And there's no known way of doing that. Therefore, the policy regulation of, of, of the policy recommendation of greatest importance to, to the European government is you must build an industry to confront this industry on different European principles. And that's the lesson of FOSS from my point of view, because we are the only people who know how to produce vast capital outcomes without capital investments, which is exactly what Brussels and Berlin and Paris need now. Never mind what London needs now. It needs sane politics now. So it is merely a dependency on all the rest of it. But this is the difficulty for the European governments, to have a way to put a dog in the fight and that requires a new way to build dogs which aren't like the way that the Chinese dogs and the North American dogs were built. And that is where we come into our own as policy players because we are the only people in the world with experience in building fleets of dogs without anything behind them. We are the only ones who can conjure ex nihilo what they require on the time scale that they need. This, I think, is what the Commission has about a year to figure out. Because if it can figure it out one year in, it could spend four years actually beginning to make it happen. And if it misses that train, there is no other train, in my opinion. Okay, thank you very much. Let's have some coffee. Let's move on.